Good afternoon. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce Professor Cédric Villani. He studied mathematics in the École Normale Supérieure de Paris and defended his PhD in 1998 on the mathematical theory of the Boltzmann equation. His main research interests are in kinetic theory and optimal transport and its application. From 2000 to 2010, he was professor at the École Normale Supérieure de Lyon, and since 2010, he is professor at the Université de Lyon. He also occupied visiting professor positions in Atlanta, Berkeley, and Princeton. Since 2009, Cédric Villani is director of the prestigious Institut Henri Poincaré, a 40-year-old national institute at the heart of the French mathematics dedicated to welcoming visiting researchers. He received several national and international prizes, including the Fermat Prize in 2009 and the Fields Medal in 2010. Since then, he is serving as a spokesman for the French mathematical community in media and political circles. He is an administrator for several associations, in particular the pro-European think tank Europa Nova. He is president of the scientific board of the African Institute for Mathematical Sciences that opened in Senegal in 2011. This institute and similar institutes in South Africa, Ghana, Cameroon and Tanzania are dedicated to the training of postgraduate students and to research in mathematical sciences in order to stimulate research activities and help to keep African scientists in Africa. Cédric Villani's website is extremely interesting and well documented, and I encourage you to visit it to learn more about him and his commitments. Professor Villani, we are honored that you accepted to give a conference at this ceremony. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. It's a great pleasure for me to be here, especially in this such important moment. I know very well, I remember very well, the joy that it is when you conclude your PhD. Such a big task. Here is one image which will summarize how it is. Let's see if I make the technology work. That's it, right? So, this is you when you have completed your task. And behind here are the beloved equations on which you have worked for such a long time. How did I arrive there at this point, defense of PhD? What happened after? Let's start to give a kind of picture. So, I was, my parents was, were not scientists at all. And when I was something like 12 years old or so, they lost any hope to help me at school in mathematics or physics. In literature, it was still okay for many years for them. Mathematics, I always found this is quite interesting. You know, one of my big loves when I was a teenager was the geometry of triangle. Wow! In geometry of triangle, you see various theorems, triangles, circles, simple elements, simple things, and they combine to create beautiful theorems and surprise. Sometimes you have three lines that come together in a single point, right by miracle. Sometimes you have four points which are aligned on the same line, like miracle. And then you learn that it's not a miracle. You learn how to explain, you learn how to prove it, 
And that's the single most important lesson you learn in mathematics. How you can prove things that look surprising and how you can find within yourself the resources to prove them. Not using ex the experiment, not using the advice of the teacher sometimes, but finding the proof that will convince you even if nobody tells you where the truth is, you may be able to find it by putting element of the proof after element of the proof. That's a beautiful thing. Anyone has to be exposed to it at least briefly, even if not doing mathematics later. And uh, that's one of the reasons why mathematics has sometimes been considered with a lot of reverence in the, among lawyers, for instance, as Abraham Lincoln, who used to say that it was by reading the elements of Euclid that he understood what it meant proving. Anyway, as a teenager, I love geometry of triangles. Let me tell you that geometry of triangle has no application whatsoever. It will serve you nothing and researchers don't care about it because there is no research in this direction. That's the absolute best example of a subject which has no application. But if it helps you to understand how to make a proof, that's not bad, is it? When you have to put together a proof of 100 pages involving equations like this one, 100 pages of reasoning, you better start putting together 10 lines of reasoning involving triangles and circles. You have to start with something simple. What happened after I did my high school? I said, I thought, okay, let's go into mathematics. Let's uh, dig a little bit. And then why not go to École Normale Supérieure? It was really like this, you know, people ask me, why did you do this or that? When did you choose mathematics? How did you realize you had this talent for mathematics? I said, well, I never realized. Just followed the advice. People told me, okay, you're good in math. Why don't you go to preparatory school? Okay. I was in preparatory school. Oh, you're good. Why don't you go to Econ Normal Superior? Okay. And then I entered Econ Normal Superior, having made no decision whatsoever. Arrive in École Normale Supérieure, I did not realize how big this place was, especially in mathematics. Let me make advertisement for my subject. You know, no other institution in the world can claim such so many Fields Medals in Fields Medalists in its former students. École Normale Supérieure trained almost all the French Fields Medalists which is about 20% of the total percentage of Fields Medal. Imagine, it's like if we would say for a certain Nobel Prize that a certain school in France has trained 20% of the laureates. That's the analog in mathematics of what is École Normale Supérieure. This you don't realize when you enter, and it's good. It's good to be a bit naive. And anyway, you have plenty of other things to discover. Now there are the people of, from literature and so on. Before we've thought, okay, I need more scientists to work with, to discuss with, but then you said, okay, it will be good to have more people in literature, in music, in philosophy, in history, whatsoever to discuss. And it was a huge blossom for me in terms of uh, cultural aspects. And then I became the president of the association for, you know, um, spectacle, going to the theater, whatever, buying tickets, selling tickets to my colleagues, and so on. And then I was president of the students' union, doing a lot of things, organizing events. Almost the end of my scientific career, by the way. Uh, it was a near, it was a close, it was a near escape. And then get back to mathematics. How, which branch of mathematics to do? This may have been my first choice, choosing that I would go more into partial differential equations and into algebra or into probability. The choice was made for very bad reasons. One has to make the choice, and that's one thing it's hard to swallow when you view it from the outside. People think that mathematicians is such a specialized field and you are in your own subject and so on. 
But what you discover when you start to study is that you need to choose a certain subfield of mathematics to dig in. And into this subfield, you will need to choose a sub subfield to start and do your work. Having seen you entering this school in mathematics, your family already thinks of you as something a bit strange. Uh, but when you tell them, now I need to specialize, they think you are completely lost. But one should uh, resist this because it's very important to start in a very given specialization. Once you have made your foray into a very specialized subject, it is still time to enlarge and enlarge. If you try to do everything at once, you cannot make it. That's one key thing about PhD, by the way, and one thing is so important uh, to understand for PhD students who, after their diploma, go and do other things than science, go into the industry to do this or that. PhD is a great training, not just as scientists. PhD is a great training because you get used to handle complex situations, digest monster information, ask people, you don't know where you're going, you learn to work in team, you etc. Many, many skills. But they are all done in a specialized subject and uh, it needs a little bit of reflection to understand that these skills will be useful in general and it also needs a bit of reflection to the people in the uh, industries and companies to understand that these are important skills also for them, independently of whether you're good in science or not. So PhD was a great period for me and if I had to name one single moment in which I knew that would be my job, mathematician, that would be PhD. In fact, that's the first time you're really in the job. Before you're doing exercises, somebody has given you some exercises of which the answer is known, but in PhD nobody knows the answer to the subject which your advisor or your advisors give you. Sometimes it's even false. I mean, the question may have no answer and you have to, to find another question and so on. And you share the life of the researcher and that's the first time where you are really in the academic world doing, sharing the life of professionals. So that's a very special moment. Some of the few episodes which happened to me during my PhD, I'd like to recollect. My first trip as a student to a foreign country. Well, not very far, okay, it was Italy, all the more that I have quite some Italian blood. And I was visiting Pavia, like 24 years old, on the invitation of a professor, Giuseppe Toscani, and when I arrived, he told me, you know, there's this Cercignani conjecture, let's uh, work on it, uh, you know, I have this idea, why don't you explore it? That's the moment to give you an idea of the subject I was working on. Let's recall that gas is made of many, many molecules of matter. Like here, of course, we have the air uh, um, around us. And this gas, we know, is not something that is quite still and so on. It's something which is very, very agitated. Even when we think the gas is still, in fact, inside, it's made of these molecules going at crazy speed and with crazy trajectories. If you start to follow one of these trajectories, you get lost immediately. Unpredictable. We get hit by these particles any second. And uh, even though it's very chaotic when you follow one particle, it's very predictable when you look at the statistics. That's the usual paradox of statistics. One object is difficult to predict, but a billion of the objects is very easy to predict in statistics. And the equations for this were established by Maxwell and Boltzmann around 1865, 1870, in what constituted a revolution in science. Not less important than the revolution of quantum mechanics that would uh, occur a few decades later. It was a real revolution. The idea that we can explain complex properties of our world at our scale by the fact that we are macroscopic beings 
in a world made of many, many microscopic particles. And Maxwell and Boltzmann pursued this idea at a time in which it was debated whether there would be indeed molecules or atoms, and the vast majority of scientists were skeptic. It was only around 1910, 1912, that people really, the huge, uh, the majority of the community accepted this existence of the atoms. After the works of people like uh, Jean Perrin, for instance. And anyway, they established this equation, which allows you to predict the evolution of the density of the gas. If you have to describe a gas, like the air around us, you are not interested in what every particle does. You're interested in the statistics of the gas, how many particles around here, how many particles around there, and so on. And uh, the Boltzmann equation allows you to do this. And uh, uh, what can you deduce from it? Many things. Boltzmann established in particular that a certain quantity, which he called the entropy, is always increasing with time. In this audience, for most people, the word entropy will be familiar. What, let's recall that what was remarkable is that Boltzmann gave a mathematical interpretation of entropy. I insist, mathematical. And after the work of Boltzmann, it became an important, an important tool in mathematics, including pure mathematics. Many theorems are proven using entropy, including what remains the most spectacular mathematical achievement of the 21st century, the proof of the Poincaré conjecture in geometry by Grigory Perelman. Entropy was there and it derived from statistical physics. Now, how did Boltzmann prove this law of increase of entropy? By combining an explicit formula which is devised to compute the entropy of a gas with the evolution given by the Boltzmann equation. It was a beautiful work, one of the first time you could make the qualitative studies of these famous and important tools which are the uh, partial differential equations. Boltzmann obtained this contribution and showed that the entropy is always increasing. From this already immediately arises the question, increases up to where? Anytime you solve something in science, there's a new question popping out. In general, several new questions, which causes the number of questions to increase exponentially fast. This is a huge embarrassment, by the way, for people in communication, because sometimes they would like to say, oh, what remains to be proven? We have already proven almost everything. What is where remain? Which are the remaining problems to solve? And you have to tell them, you know, there are more and more problems every year that we have to solve, and it's, uh, it's normal. That's the way science goes. One of these problems ar arising after the Boltzmann equation was how strong is the entropy increase in the Boltzmann equation? Does it increase fast or slow? Give yourself the statistics of particles. Maybe it has the shape of the well-known Gauss curve, or maybe it has a double bump, or whatever. Will the entropy increase be strong? Will the disorder in the gas increase strongly or not? This is the kind of questions I worked in my PhD. One of these uh, conjectures, particular conjectures, was that the increase of entropy had to be at least as strong as the difference between the entropy of the gas and the entropy of the uh, Gaussian curve which corresponds, the maximum of the entropy. This was known as the Cercinini conjecture. And, okay, there was this hope to try and, uh, and solve this by using the technique that my Italian colleague suggested. So, my Italian colleague was director of the laboratory, so he had zero time to work on his research and was only doing administrative stuff. And I was a young PhD, so I had all my time to work and work. And I started to examine his idea. And after scribbling a few pages, 
I understood that this idea was complete rubbish and could lead nowhere. It was so naive and so on. I thought, what am I going to do with this? But you know, in the computation, in the process of doing the computations, that was something that attracted my attention. A very nice identity. Something like you're doing this big computation and some of the terms in your formula, they combine in a harmonious way to do something, for instance, a perfect square, something like this. I will show it to you on this second slide. And you see this, you see, wow, this must mean something. And uh, what I thought was, this is too beautiful, it has to be. This is here in red. You may not appreciate immediately the beauty of the formula, but I swear when you are fighting with the computation and getting the, and getting the, the, the computations done, and you encounter something like this here, a perfect square with the, the square on the right, you feel there is something behind this. And it was indeed the start of the solution. This is one lesson we learned and that I learned in my PhD, beauty in the sense of harmonious uh, organization of some elements can lead to the truth, can lead to what is good, to what you are looking for. And the other lesson which I learned there is that sometimes uh, following a wrong path can lead you to a right conclusion. And this, it occurred so many times in my PhD after my PhD. The role of chance encounters, you think you're working on this and you discover something else. The role of exchanging with people all the time. The role of traveling, getting new ideas, new culture, new skills here and there. This is also important. Another of these uh, dramatic short events I recall after my PhD was when I was visiting professor in uh, visiting uh, assistant professor in Berkeley in the Miller Institute. And uh, this was later, like I was in my early 30s, and uh, with very good conditions on this beautiful Berkeley campus for six months, no teaching duties, no administrative duties, no research duties, just attending a lunch once a week with the colleagues of the Miller Institute. And for this, I was paid three times my French salary. <laughs> not bad. But still, I swear, I was not so happy because this Dan Berkeley uh, mathematics building is very badly designed. If you go there, it's very easy. Go on the Berkeley campus, look for the ugliest building of all, and you will know it is a mathematics building. It is a mathematics building, and it's very badly designed because people never meet in there. It's isolated, and these guys are super smart, super busy, so you never see them. And I was there in my office. What the hell am I doing here? I'm not interacting. I can work on my own stuff, okay, but I could do this as well in France or in uh, uh, Patagonia or in Greenland or whatever. What am I going to do here? And then arrived somebody unexpectedly, was a visiting professor from uh, visiting professor from uh, where was he from Ann Arbor? He was from Ann Arbor. Hello, my name is John Lott. I'm a geometer. I have read your works with your German collaborator Felix Otto. I see how you combine the Ricci curvature and the entropy. With this, will make will make important uh, contributions to non-Euclidean uh, geometry and so on. What the hell is this? And uh, I had to go and fetch my keys anyway, so this encounter was just 10 minutes, and he started to explain me the, his idea. The idea was to use a program I had been starting with a collaborator, indeed a German collaborator, to tackle problems, some fundamental problems coming from geometry. This 10 minutes encounter was a change in my life. It was the start of collaboration, and for years we collaborated. The program was more than fulfilled. Not only did we achieve everything we 
tried to prove with this, but other people jumped in. Now there are dozens of people working on this and many papers which I don't even have time to read, all are genetic from this uh, encounter. Let me describe uh, in a nutshell what was it in what I call the experiment of the lazy gas. It shows another thing that we in mathematics love, the encounter between fields. And often the encounter between fields, between specialties, comes with the encounter between people. That's extremely important to uh, realize and to understand in a time in which it's impossible for a given scientist to have a view, to have a large view of science. I mean, except for cultural look, it's impossible to be expert in many fields. It is said that the last mathematician who mastered the whole of mathematics was Henri Poincaré, who died more than 100 years ago. I think it is fair to say that nowadays a top-level mathematician masters maybe 3 to 4% of the field of mathematics. And, of course, in the other sciences, the situation is not better. Then we need each other, we need encounters, and this is important because often you have great progress coming from the interaction of very different fields. So here is this experiment of the lazy gas. Is this a pointer? Yes. You, we all know that curvature is something important, and uh, uh, you know if you try to do geometry on the surface of the Earth, it has nothing to do with the geometry of triangle as we learned it in school. But uh, also we know that geometry can be important in physics in this sense. We know from the work of Albert Einstein and general relativity, of which the 100th anniversary will be celebrated next year, that curvature of the universe can curb the light rays. Now imagine you want to understand if our universe is curved in a positive way or negative way. How do you measure that? If you ask a guy from general relativity, he or she will tell you, well, look at the, how stars are seen and if there is some deformation. If you are in a world in which you always, because of the distortion, overestimate the size of the light sources, it means you are in a universe which has non-negative curvature, positive curvature, let's see. But now here's a completely different way to see this curvature and it was crucial in this discovery. This is how you would explain it to Boltzmann. Imagine you have a gas with a certain configuration and you impose the gas, you are your god, and you command the gas to change configuration and arrive in another configuration with a different density. The gas has to obey because you are almighty but the gas will do so because he's lazy in the way which uh, is the most economic, which spends the least amount of kinetic energy. During this process, all along, from time equal zero to time equal one, measure the entropy of the gas using the formula of Boltzmann. If the curve is a concave curve pointing upward, always, then you know you live in a space of positive curvature. So in this experiment, which is a thought experiment, which you can translate into a theorem, you see that three very different fields of mathematics and physics are united. Entropy and statistics of gas, geometry and curvature, and the idea of most economic path, which in this sense takes its roots in the work of Leonid Kantorovich, Nobel Prize of Economics, and the great uh, math Soviet mathematicians. The three fields are different, different people, different books, different techniques, whatever, and somehow the meeting of the three was a big progress. From that meeting came a number of new theorems, in particular new proofs of geometry, which were open problems for geometers and which they had no idea how to handle before this connection was established. This Here with this we see again the power of chance encounters and that may be the most uh, single important thing we are taught when we do scientific research 
being be it in PhD or be after PhD. It's time for me to conclude. Uh, one of the key things that I've learned in my in my job, and the two anecdotes I told. Uh, we'll tell it again, and also the many such anecdotes and problems which were on the way before I could uh, get these works that uh, awarded me the Fields Medal and which I told in a broad audience book. You know, the scientific research progress is such, so chaotic, so complicated. One should always try to have some luck. Most important is to understand when you are lucky and when you can exploit this. If there are opportunities and you don't see them of luck, this will not be it. And uh, to be curious, of course, increases your chance to, stump into, uh, to, to, to stumble onto some piece of luck. To have lots of contacts is important. Also, not to consider yourself as in a certain category. I started, I was an analyst, then I did probability, I did some geometry, etc. Uh, I found it an extreme advantage to not be, you know, put in a box and I'm doing this, but uh, keeps the, the independence. At the same time, one needs definitely to get some special skills, uh, otherwise you can just not make it either. And I think that's, I think that's all of it. If you, I did not speak of the particular problem which was the key to the Fields Medal, the Landau damping, but those who read the book or those who take a look at what I said about this will find this over and over as it is told. A lot of work in which you don't know where you're going, sometimes get on the right track for very bad reasons, Sometimes the encounter with the right person that you did not expect. Sometimes sheer luck. Sometimes your intuition whispering to you something that you had no idea it would be the, the right solution. And anyway, the joy to be able to have a work in which, by definition, you don't really know what you will be doing in the future. And always your future is writing up uh, little by little. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there a question and answer session? Yes, with pleasure. Um, hi, I'm Clément Grandin from uh, the Institut Pasteur. Thank you very much for your very interesting presentation. And um, maybe like a lot of other people here, I'm wondering uh, if you and your fellows, um, researchers in mathematics, sometimes perform experiments in the way we biologists and physicists understand it. And if yes, what do mathematics experiments look like? Mm -hmm. The answer is yes and no. Or rather, the answer is no and yes. Uh, if you look at the, the definition of mathematics, the answer is no. And that's precisely what makes mathematics particular. Mathematics is science, and in the way it works as a community, also in the general goals and so on, it is science. But the differences, there are uh, a few differences with the rest. The first difference is that the object in itself is the abstraction. You may be, study, be a mathematician and study fluids, or gas, or biology, but if you're a mathematician, it means you're working at the level of the equations. Your work will be to prove theorems, or to get intuition from the theorems, and so on. And in the result which you give, which will be a proof, there is no reference to experiment. The answer has to come from within. The most impressive exemplification of this is certainly the status of the Riemann hypothesis. 
the most famous open problem of all mathematics. This is a problem which was posed 150 years ago or so, and uh, it's, it is about whether certain points, which are the roots of a certain equation, are all on a single line. You know, you remember I was telling about in geometry, sometimes four points on a line, but here it's about an infinite number of points lying in a certain line. And this has been checked with numerical experiments for trillions of these roots, trillions of points. But in mathematics, even a trillion of uh, clues, trillions of experimental verifications is not a proof. This is a real difference. In any other field of science, but, or even of, you know, of mankind, human thought, if you make a theory and you test it a thousand times and it is true, or a million times and it is true on the experiments, you accept this theory as a truth but not in mathematics. It needs to be the absolute certainty which is given only by the logical reasoning. Now, that being said, we do some kinds of experiments for the intuition. Experiments can be looking at, uh, you're trying to prove something. Let's look, search for something simpler and see if we can prove it. And if we can prove it, it will be a hint that our goal may be true, you know, something that comforts you. <clears throat> or we may go to the computer and say, let's make a simulation of the result and see if the property that I'm trying to prove looks true. You know, after seeing that billions of zeros or fruits are lying on the same line, it looks reasonable to expect that the theorem is true, you know, you will search in this direction rather than this one. In this way, we do experiments. Let's uh, exemplify this with another very famous problem, regularity of Navier-Stokes uh, solutions. Navier-Stokes equation is the most popular model for fluid mechanics, taking into account compressibility or incompressibility, but taking into account the viscosity of a fluid. If you want to make a model of the gas around us, by the way, you can use the Boltzmann equation, but it's a bit of an overkill. It will be better to use the Navier-Stokes equations. There is a famous problem according whether the solutions of the Navier-Stokes equations in for an incompressible fluid are smooth or not smooth, say continuous or not. It means take a fluid, and start the fluid with a certain velocity fluid, velocity field, sorry. Smooth, no discontinuity in the velocity of the fluid. Will this remain smooth or will spontaneously some things, some catastrophe occur, like a discontinuity in velocity, like the discontinuity that you may have, for instance, in the wake of a supersonic plane? Will this or not? Nobody knows. The problem was asked uh, maybe 100, uh, 80 years ago, for non-viscous equation, it goes back even to the 18th century. Nobody knows, and we can, however, try on the computer to make solutions and see if there is blow-up, if there is a catastrophe. Nobody has ever been able to see a catastrophe like this occur in a computer, and that's one reason why mean more and more people suspect there is no blow-up. 30 years ago, there would have been more people expecting blow-up than nowadays. So in a way, we do experiments in this way, in this sense. Thank you. Thank you for a very interesting talk. Can I ask you about the very beginning? At what age did you start studying mathematics? And at what age you would suggest that we teach children mathematics? I started uh, um, to be I, I would not be able to say when I started to study mathematics. I don't remember a time where I did not find this interesting. You know, between interesting and uh, fascinated, there is a there is a gap. And uh, very early, I would bother in class, you know, or reading books, or. Uh, looking at what my, I remember books that my father would bring up from uh, uh, from flea market and things like this. 
Let's put up the slide, is possible. Peut-on mettre la... Euh, remettre basculer la vidéo, s'il vous plaît Ok. I will show you one of my earliest memories of mathematics. This uh, was one of my favorite animated cartoons when I was a kid. Donald in Math Magic Land. Uh, I saw it recently again. I thought, wow, is this naive? Uh, but uh, it was very successful in me. It insisted on the relation of mathematics to the scale, you know in music how to construct the, the various uh, the, the scale, and uh, the golden ratio. Okay, Golden ratio uh, is uh, overrated. But for a kid, it's okay. Thank you very much. Um, I was wondering to what extent the, the increase of uh, uh, calculating power of computer put back in question some theorems that had, had been proven right in the past. Oh, oh. there are uh, first. First, it has to be accepted that there are mistakes in mathematics as in any other science, just like because the human brain is far from perfect. And uh, regularly one discovers a big flaw or a small flaw in this or that, or also sometimes it may, to prove something, may need an awful amount of time convincing people checking the details. I was talking about the Poincaré conjecture proved by Grigory Perelman. It took seven years of solitary work for Perelman to get the proof. This is one of the uh, most amazing achievements in the past decades. But it took three years to the mathematical community to be convinced that the proof was correct. And there's a really thing here checking, big arguments, long arguments, a recent proof in a, a big theorem recently proven in uh, general relativity, um, spanned maybe 800 pages, the proof, just the proof. So checking proof is really difficult, really, really. And having help of the computers to help check the proofs is a very interesting and fascinating possibility which is starting to be a possible dream with the uh, work on at the intersection between logic and computer science in which INRIA has played a leading role by the way. So some theorems, some big theorems have been checked uh, by computer. It's not proved by computer, it's checking by computer. And there is a big work which has to be made for translating the proof into a form that the computer can check. This is related also to the problem of checking the huge computer softwares which equip the cars or the shuttles or whatever. So there are important industrial relations, industrial um, uh, spin-offs of this, of this uh, field. Um, in general, the computer has provided tremendous help to mathematicians in the modeling, in the intuition, and it's uh, probably, it's likely that it will gain in the, in the checking part also. And one should add also, there is some misconception that computers, little by little, will replace the mathematicians. It is the contrary. You see that mathematician is in development and in development. The more computers you have, the more mathematicians you need, because they are working at the interface, you know, translating and preparing and so on. That's one of the reasons why just a few weeks ago, an American, uh, American company uh, doing a ranking of all the possible jobs they could spot put mathematician as the number one job in the world. Okay, maybe you may object, mathematician, or you may say yes, but it's mathematician with an American salary.
other question? Hey, very good. <laughs> when I was a PhD student, uh, and uh, and I had to and first recommendation letter that my advisor wrote for me for me to get a, a job as assistant professor in Economal Supérieur. He wrote that I was striking by the unusual number of questions that I was asking him. <laughs> so I had a, another question, more based on what you said about the new necessity to have multidisciplinarity and uh, the fact that you highlighted that the mathematic building in Berkeley was absolutely wrongly constructed. So I would have to know your opinion on what would be, for example, in the future, like uh, an example of institute that is uh, designed to, to encourage such, uh, uh, such encounters and inter interdisciplinarity. If I was, you know, good uh, at marketing, I would say my institute, of course. <laughs> but uh, my institute, like most institutes in, uh, in Paris, uh, uh, have to um, do with the history. There is some old building that you renovate and you have to take into account many parameters. You never optimize and it, uh, it's never meant to be perfect. By the way, perfect buildings completely optimized are usually completely boring and they are not the solution either. But a good institute, an institute in which there are some central points uh, where you have typically an organization in which people naturally bump into each other. The location of the uh, dining room is crucial. Some people insist on the location of uh, bathrooms. Some people insist on the location of coffee machines. We like to think my institute is entirely devoted to inviting people and uh, having uh, them having exchanges. We have no permanent researchers, only visitors. And we like to define this sometimes as the coffee machine strategy. The many things will happen at the coffee machine. We have the coffee is free for everybody and uh, we favor interactions in this uh, style informal. So certainly in the future, people will pay more and more attention to areas which are not directly functional, which are besides offices and lecture halls, all the areas which are in between, in which you circulate and you, you, you pass through. Examples of uh, buildings which have been optimized, having in mind that people should encounter are the the um, the Pixar company. I know they did this this job explicitly. How to make it sure that employees would uh, bump into each other, and it's in their kind of job. It's a typical example of big projects in which you have to have many many people working in many many different specialties. Um, <clears throat> me again, as I know now that you're not embarrassed by numerous questions. I Yes, you know, questions. I was in South Korea last summer and they discovered for such events, they give rewards to the people who ask the most questions, like books and so on. Um, I understood that while you were a student, you tended to be kind of overwhelmed with administrative tasks or students' um, you know, activities. I'm just curious to know if now, as um, director of uh, Institut Poincaré, you are still able to perform some research on that? You know, history repeats itself, and the situation is even much worse than when I was the direct president of the Students' Union. And do, but do, do you have some PhD students under your responsibility to, to do, your, do your research? My last PhD student defended two weeks ago, so now I, I don't have any and did not start any new. You see, this is very serious. One should always have. I had, I had uh, this was my sixth PhD student, uh, which is not so much, but I like to think that we should care about PhD students. Number of PhD students depends a lot on the field, on the institution, the habits, etc. But I never had uh, more than three at the same time and a total of, of six, you see. They all were very useful. One of my, my first PhD student 
was the one who collaborated on me, uh, with me on the Landau damping. Without his, uh, without, uh, his work and his help, I would never have made it to the solution of the problem. When you train students, it's fascinating because if you do your job well, they will be able to go further than you. That's the main problem of the school, of the teacher, of whatever, train people to become better in a certain direction than you. And then they can be your, your allies and so on. So this is, a, this, is a, this is one serious thing as a, a researcher. On the other hand, uh, I see that there is a real, real lack and, and a problem about the contact between science and society. It's not that it's a problem in itself, but it's rather small, the number of people who do it really seriously. I've been one of them in various directions in the past years, as you have recalled in the introduction. And uh, uh, the number of requests which I receive is, is uh, totally out of control. Every day there is a new invitation for this, this and that. I spend my time saying, I'm so sorry, but so sorry, but so lately I've been extremely busy and so on. And uh, the whole society wants this. The good news is that we are very popular as scientists, extremely popular. And the lesson I take from this is we, in general, need to get more involved into this. So a few years from now, when you get Nobel Prize, you can do the same job as me and we share the burden. Just to continue on interdisciplinarity. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, so I was wondering, do you have a personal intuition on? Uh, you also said that these uh, meetings with various people from other fields were also kind of random, uh, of course. But do you have some kind of personal intuition on which other fields uh, could lead? So the interactions with which other fields could lead to this is, this most is significant uh, advances in mathematics in yeah, the future. This, this is important. <laughs> you need at this. You 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 need. It's true in research, but it's true also in other in many other uh, issues in many other situations. You need to be really good at some things. Really really skilled at some things and to have a broad view of the rest in the sense of getting informed. It can be listening to seminars, it can be discussing, it can be reading, whatever. To have some vague idea of what goes on. Then, when, even if you, you, you don't know about this, but you know there's this guy who does this, you know there's this girl who is expert at this, maybe there is some connection and that's when the start of the discussion can be. So you have at the same time to be very much into something and to have your eyes, your ears wide open for the rest. That's, and where is the, where is exactly, where should you put the cursor is a tricky problem. I don't have any particular, particular answer to this. If you know too much in general, this is a problem rather than an advantage because it will hinder you, you will lose spontaneity, and so on. Uh, if you don't know enough, you're not able to see where a connection can, can occur. It's a tricky balance to find. Okay, but um, uh, so if you, are there like fields, other, other scientific fields where you think there could be there, there is more chance to, to have oh. fruitful... Um, uh, you mean in the sense of which, uh, which sciences, for instance? For example. Well, for instance, it's, uh, mathematics is very clear, goes together. The, the, the two sciences with which it goes well are physics and, uh, and computer science. Computer science in its structure is just mathematics with a certain particular independence. 
Um, and physics goes hand in hand very well with physics, with mathematics for, for several hundreds of years and will continue to do so. Mathematics and biology is the enigma because everybody accepts, uh, expects wonders to be possible to make in biology with mathematics, but it's so very difficult for, to, to try to get the, the, the right concepts. Um, use of modeling and simulation and so on has been extremely powerful in some areas of biology and medicine. However, uh, it's frustrating for the mathematicians. We, we like to understand, get the deep. A gas, okay, there's the entropy, there's the temperature, and with uh, five concepts you understand it and can, can go on with it. But a cell, wow. <laughs> Some people try it. Recently I was listening to a talk by Antoine Danchin uh, about, about uh, theoretical biology did not really understand, uh, it's, it's, it, is, it, is, it is very tricky. Thank you. I uh, was also visiting recently, in, it was in Oslo, uh, it, um, a laboratory of computer science named Simula. And they had a great team of uh, simulation of the heart, modeling the heart equations and so on, discuss uh, this and this and that, and they explain, we still don't understand, still so many problems in the model. By the way, I, I learned from there that we don't understand why defibrillator works. <laughs> and they said, yeah, but it works, it works, says many, many people, but we don't know. Okay, so damn frustrating the biology. That leads me to the, to the next question, because uh, what do you think is the main problem? Is the lack of communication between the scientists? Like, it is impossible for a biologist to explain to a mathematician, like, what is he really doing? Or maybe this is just because of how complex are these uh, cellular f phenom phenomena? Is it maybe possible to isolate something and study it without the background of the whole cell? Mm. Like it's more. It's more about no. It's more about this. It's not a problem of communication. So first, as a general rule, it's always the the most abstract, uh, the more abstract of two people talking to each other who has to make the effort of uh, understanding. So in the dialogue between biologist and mathematician, most of the effort has to be made by the mathematician. And some mathematicians, did, some of the best in the world, did really put huge effort into understanding, reading the books, talking with the people, and so on. And uh, the outcome was very limited. Take Misha Gromov, who may, be, who may be the most important currently living geometer in the world. He spent years and years to work to animate uh, seminars in, in biology. From there resulted very interesting discussions, everybody was happy, etc. But at the end, we cannot quote one single mathematical concept, relevant concept, emerging from all these discussions. Certainly the second, um, the second reason you mentioned is, is the right, it's intrinsically complicated, and it's this uh, spectacular problem of difficulty of isolating things. When you are in front of a physics problem, you can isolate one effect, another, another, Let's take out the viscosity, see what happens. Let's look at these simplified models, see what happens, and focus on the things one after the other. Let's just take the gravitation, then let's add the relativity, etc. And when you are in biology, it seems you have to consider everything at once or, or nothing happens. I'm caricaturating a little bit, but it's more li like it. It's much more global. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Milani. We would uh, like to listen to you all the afternoon, but we have now <laughs> to move to, <laughs> to the next session. So, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh,